As we continue to worship together this morning, we are focusing our minds and our hearts towards our scripture for today. And so if you would stand out of reverence for God's word. This comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. This is verses one through eight. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. And with him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome with fear. But Jesus came and touched them and said, get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say, thanks be to God. So just no guilt or shame associated with if you haven't heard it. I'm just curious, how many of y'all have actually heard or read the story of the transfiguration that was read earlier before? Just raise your hands. I mean, just put a baseline because this is not anything that I ever paid attention to. This is not one that you read in children's Sunday school or youth group or anything because imagine going to a volunteer um, Sunday school teacher for third graders and handing them the story of Jesus now appearing next to two other people magically and saying, here, explain this. And what you would normally get is that volunteer saying, I'll volunteer next week, or I quit, or something of that sort. Um, but I never really, I, it's not a story that ever just jumped off the page for me until I started really digging into it for this week. Um, and I didn't realize how important it was, but I did, also didn't realize there is this whole um, tradition of commentary and interpretation of the scripture of people who give Peter a really hard time for his reaction when one person all of a sudden becomes three up on a mountaintop and he comes and says, well, let's build three dwelling places, one for Moses, one for Jesus, one for Elijah. And I didn't realize there was this whole history of people um, kind of dogging on Peter for an ignorant response, like we would do any better. Like if we were approached, you know, or just magically had this experience happen, like we would have any kind of response that was different than, well, let me build three dwelling places. Let me try and be hospitable. Let me try and mark this occasion for as special and sacred as it is. And I think you know, perhaps one reason why Peter does this is Peter comes from an altar building tradition. Uh, it, the disciples are from the Jewish Hebrew tradition, and in the Old Testament, there are way more than this. There's, I think I counted 26, 27 different times where people build altars, which is usually just stacking stones on top of each other, if not building an entire temple. But Noah, when he exits the boat and brings all the animals out, he's so Thanks, he's giving thanks to God for deliverance from the flood. And so in Genesis 8, he builds an altar. And then Abram comes on the scene in Genesis 12, and he's called out of Ur to go into the land that God will show him. And every time he moves to a different location, he just builds an altar as a way of marking that God's presence was there, I suppose. And then Isaac, Abram's son, or when he, Abraham by this point, Abraham's son, um, becomes the inheritor of that promise, of that covenant, to have descendants as numerous as the stars and a land that they can call their own. And so Isaac then builds an altar in that place. And then we get to Moses going through the Exodus, and there are several times, including when Moses is guided to defeat the Amalek army, who, uh, to celebrate that, builds an altar to worship God in that moment. And then one of my favorite ones is Joshua, um, as they are crossing over the Jordan River to get into the Promised Land. Um, he's instructed to, for each of the 12 tribes of Israel to go pick up a large stone as an altar and go wade into the river and put it in the middle of the river. And all 12 of them do this, and it's the second time that water is stopped. And so the river stops flowing, they can all cross over. But how it is interpreted is the end of the story in Joshua 4 says, so that this may be a sign among you, 
When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. One thing we have to recognize about what they're doing when they're building altars is they're not simply trying to just build a sacred space in a regular place so that they can return there. What they are doing is they are trying to tell stories. They're trying to uh, take a, an amazing experience and communicate that that happened in this particular place so that when others walk by, they may ask, well, what did God do in this moment? And they can point to the altar or the memorial or the monument and say, this is how our history was shaped. This is how we were formed. And so they're educational. They're inspirational. They're not meant to be static examples of what God used to do. They're meant to be storytellers of if God used to do that, then imagine what God will do now. So you can't blame Peter for saying, let's build an altar. Let's build a monument. Let's encapsulate this space, because that's what we do as well. We tend to have these really unique, special experiences. Some people call them mountaintop high experiences. And we try to save those experiences and hold on to those experiences. It's the same reason why we vacation in the same spot year after year, some of us, or go to the same camp over and over again, so that we can try and have the same experience, so that we can hold on to something that is special, especially when it comes to God. I told you all about the um, chaotic Holy Spirit church that my friend leads down in um, Spring, Texas last week when we were talking about Pentecost. And um, when I was lost on the way looking for this church, I was driving and um, I saw a sign for a small Catholic church. And I can't remember what saint it was named after, but it was Saint something Catholic Church. And then right below it, it said, Worship Time, 9.30 a.m. And then in really big capital letters, it said, Latin only. I don't know if you grew up Catholic and have experienced Latin Mass, but apparently that's still happening. It's been since 1964, Vatican II, when they said, you know what, it's okay for you to do mass in the language of the people around you. If you're in Brazil, you can do it in Portuguese. If you're in Russia, you can do it in Russian. If you're in Fairview, you can do it in, in English or, or Spanish even. And so they, uh, so it, it's been allowed, but I know people personally who will claim that if you do not do the mass in Latin, it doesn't count because that's how they grew up. That is the tradition that they had. And they had a wonderful experience in that tradition. And that's how traditions become traditions, is that something meaningful happens, something amazing and special happened. And so we want to encapsulate that experience, and we want to do it over and over and over again, until sometimes it becomes so rote that we lose the meaning of the tradition, instead of bringing the tradition with us and saying, well, what great happened in that moment that I can carry forward with us? One of the examples I have used is... Um, uh, and y'all wouldn't know this, but in the traditional service, we open up with a call to, call to worship prayer. Um, and we used to, from the time I've been here till before the time I was, I've been here, to up until we had to go online only during COVID, we would open up with a responsive prayer. The leader would say something, everybody else would respond, and it was kind of this get engaged, get involved, kind of like our music is here to get everybody engaged in the same language and the same flow of worship in contemporary. And so um, when COVID hit, I uh, just needed something that I knew everybody could say on some level. So we didn't have to do call and response. So we said, you know what, let's do the Apostles' Creed. It is, um, it, it's been the same for several hundred years. Everybody can at least look it up and follow along. Most people in traditional know the Apostles' Creed. So we did that as a uniting thing during COVID. Well, as soon as we opened back up again, we kind of did the Apostles' Creed. And eventually I said, you know, I'd love to get back to this call and response, get people uh, ebb and flow between the leader and the, and the crowd. And the first Sunday that we did the call, call and response prayer again, someone came up to me and said, why don't we do the Apostles' Creed anymore? I just said, well, it was only one week. And he said, we've always done the Apostles' Creed. I said, how long have you gone to church here? And they said, basically since it opened. I said, do you remember what we did for the first 18 years of the church? Or at least as long as we've had traditional worship. Because traditions, what do they say, a habit takes 21 days to develop? In a church, a tradition takes one hour to develop. <laughs> At Texas A&M, it takes 10 minutes to develop. That's so, how when I just threw in there last service, I figured I'd poke on the Aggies in this service as well. 
right? When it comes to our experience with God, especially, we are looking, we, we tend to ignore God in the mundane fruits of the Spirit kind of actions that happen. We are looking for spiritual highs from God, and so when we receive one of those, when something makes sense to us, we hold on to it, and we say, this is our tradition. So we can't blame Peter for what he's doing of trying to hold on to this experience. And what Peter sees when he sees Moses appear and when he sees Elijah appear is he is going back to the days when everybody says, if you follow the law, then you will be found worthy and God will truly be with you and God will truly bless you and guide you. It's what's been ingrained in who he is. And so he sees Moses, who is said to be the one who received all of the law, brought it down from Sinai. And so he sees Moses and says, oh, of course, if we follow the law, this is what it's supposed to be. This whole means. We, if we follow the law, we go to that monument, we plant our flag there, and we say this is what's going to bring us holiness. Because Elijah also is the prophet. And the prophets are the ones who call us back to the law. And so Elijah's obviously there to lead me back to Moses. And Jesus is here to validate the experience. And, and I think one thing, that even though in Matthew 16, the chapter before, uh, Jesus asked Peter, who, is, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, the Messiah. I think that James and John and Peter, on some level, until this transfiguration experience, still see the Messiah as just a prophet or a teacher, someone to call them back to holiness, someone to call them back to something that used to be, this kind of great era that used to be. But Peter misses something in Elijah being there. Peter misses something in Elijah being there. In Malachi, it says, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And Elijah's meant to turn heads. Now, some people look at John the Baptist as an Elijah figure. Here on the Mount of the Transfiguration, Elijah is there, and Elijah is said to precede the Messiah. And transfiguration be means to become illuminated or luminescent, to be made more clean, more perfect than one is. And so as Elijah shows up, as Moses is there, as Jesus is becoming illuminated, what really is taking place here, what the disciples are experiencing, is this full revelation of Jesus being um, the encapsulation and fulfillment of the law, as it says in Matthew chapter 7. What they are experiencing is God fully uh, present in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I think for the first time they're seeing, yes, this call to repentance, yes, this call to order, but not so much in that it is something in the past that is static and stuck that we have to go back to, but in a dynamic presence that is walking and talking and living and breathing amongst us. A God that doesn't exist in the past or in a set of rules, but a God that exists with them, that when the voice of God comes down and says, this is my son, the beloved, and they are scared, and they're cowering in fear because everything they've known about God has been law and order and repentance and fear, but the dynamic presence of God, the fully human, fully divine Jesus, comes and puts his hand on them and says, don't be afraid. Because when God is a distant memory, when God is a monument, God is an imposing church building, or God is an imposing rock structure, fear is part of the equation. When God is bound up in a set of rules and a set of law that if you break, you're in trouble, God is fear. But when God is a dynamic God that moves in us and leads us toward the cross and eventually gives us the Spirit to empower us, all of a sudden it's something that we don't need to be afraid because it's not like we are trying to gain something that we've lost, but we are following a God that is moving ahead of us. And that God is with us and move us. We don't have to be afraid. And Peter writes about this experience. Peter writes, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he even talks about the experience of hearing the voice of uh, God saying, This is my son with whom I am well pleased. This is me incarnate in this person with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. John writes about this experience. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. They're writing about this experience in which they recognize a living God that is dynamic, moving ahead of them towards something greater that they don't have to fear, they don't have to miss, they don't have to mourn. They can simply be guided by as they listen to what God calls them to be. They recognize that in Jesus is this fully human, fully divine, dynamic presence of God and Ephesians sums it up really well. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. And Paul would later ask us the question, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? What we're meant to glean from the reason they share this story is that Peter wanted to take this moment of God. He wanted to memorialize God. He wanted to keep God in this box, and he wanted to make sure that they could always come to a static place of God. But what Jesus and what God and the Holy Spirit do in this moment is show that God is not a static force. God is not something that is memorialized. God is not something that exists in the past. God is a living, moving, breathing presence that we see through the person of Jesus Christ. And then Pentecost, which we celebrated last week, something that indwells within us and around us and through us so that we get to be part of the living, breathing presence of God in this world. God is not calling us to the past. God is calling us to the present, to be present with others. And if you go forward from this transfiguration story, the listen to him part is when Jesus starts saying things like, those who, would, uh, those who would seek to gain their life will lose their life. If you do not take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciples. Even Jesus is showing us in the actions proceeding or going from the transfiguration that God is not a God who, who is going to just sit there and rule from on high, but God is a God who gets into human human business and leads us in the way of sacrificial love and overwhelming grace, ultimately to a cross so that our sins might be forgiven, so that we might have a great example of love to follow, and that we might be empowered with the Holy Spirit to go and do these same things, so that we don't get stuck just within our own, whatever our tradition looks like as a bubble or within our church building boxes, but that we recognize that part of what God is doing in this world is giving us the Holy Spirit so that we can walk with Jesus, so that we can be those people who listen to God, do not fear God, but share the love of God out into the world as dynamic presence, as people who are not holding on to something, who are not even seeking to gratify ourselves, but are seeking to be a dynamic presence of God that others can see out in this world. I mean, do we not know that if God doesn't want to be just stuck on a mountaintop. But God wants to come down from the mountain. And I'll say that most of Israel, most of Israel is wilderness. When Jesus comes down from the mountain, we see that God is not stuck on the mountaintop. God is not stuck in all the highs of our life. But God leads us through even the hard things. Even through the dry things, even through the boring times. so that we might recognize that God isn't just stuck in one moment, and therefore neither should we. That we, as people of faith, must be always looking forward, always looking forward to maybe what was great about those traditions, what was great about those experiences. How can we show that to somebody in a new way? How can we experience God in a new way? Because do we not know that our body is a temple to the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit lives in us, well, imagine what others might be able to see themselves. Let's pray. Christmas God, may we hear your voice over your Son, with whom you are well pleased, and may our ears be attuned to listen. May we be attuned to listen to the words of Christ in the many ways that they come, ways that call us to sacrifice, ways that call us to love, ways that remind us of the peace of your presence here with us. And God, in that peace, discomfort, and challenge that Christ offers to us, may we feel the rushing breath of the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we might not grow too comfortable and too static. So we might descend from the mountain and find those in the wilderness who need to experience the same love that we have experienced from you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.